ocean acidification. I'll just read this little definition of what it is. The release of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere from fossil fuel burning, cement production, and deforestation processes has resulted in atmospheric CO2 concentrations that have increased about 40% since the beginning of the industrial era. We have managed to change the chemistry of the atmosphere in a rather significant manner. <clears throat> and that, uh, since we don't seem to be abating our release of CO2 anytime soon, uh, there's enough material already in the atmosphere to, to make it, there's a course of the change in the chemistry of the ocean that cannot be undone at this point. Um, we can, however, make it worse by not changing our behavior. Um, so I'm going to attempt to show you what, how certain creatures respond to elevated CO2 conditions. And then I'm going to try and show you how beautiful many of the creatures are that will be affected so that you can uh, help your students or anybody else who's willing to listen decide what kind of world they want to live in. This is uh, off the coast of Italy. It's actually really, uh, what you're seeing is about five feet um, down, slightly subtitle, on an island called Ischia. And it is the site of a natural CO2 vent that's not, it's a subduction zone and as the limestone is forced under one plate under another, it off gasses CO2 because there's just a little temperature uh, rise, but it's not accompanied by the, the normal volcanic venting of uh, sulfur and other things that would add complication to the observation. So this is a little natural lab around the corner from this. This is regular ambient open ocean uh, pH situation. And you see down on the bottom there's um, sea urchins, there's all of this texture and architecture and places for creatures to hold on to and to hide and other small creatures to hide in. And then when you get out in the open where the CO2 vent is, all of that texture is gone. And it's replaced by algae, which uh, non-calcifying algae loves elevated CO2. So not everything suffers. Certain things thrive in elevated CO2 situations, like certain things thrive in elevated temperature. It's not like we are going to destroy the world. Life will find a way to deal with whatever we could throw at it. But it will change it dramatically from its current state, which we, we have evolved into the current state of the world. We, the, the way the world is now is what we have a use for. It's what, we, we're, it's what we're made of. So radically changing it is not going to make us more comfortable. So when in an elevated CO2 situation, all of that texture goes away. So you, this is a piece of seagrass, and it has encrusting coral and algae on it. That little snail has these encrusting uh, worms that, that build their uh, little houses. So in an elevated CO2 situation, all of that encrusting material is stripped away from the seagrass. The seagrass actually grows faster in an elevated CO2 situation, but it doesn't have its encrusting material that actually protects it from fish. So you see all of that seagrass is just nipped down to the very uh, bottom by a few species of fish. So this is, this is a snail, but it's not just a snail. He's got a dozen species of other things grow on the shell. It's not just a snail, it's a community. <laughs> this, is, this, this was out 
This is away from the elevated CO2 situation on the same rock face, but just around the corner. You go just downstream from where the CO2 vent is, and all of that material is stripped away from the snail that's, that's living in that spot. Same thing with limpets. The one on the left is covered with encrusting coral and algae and, and other red algaes that, that fix carbon um, to sort of build their, um, like trees and, and, and woody plants use cellulose to build structure. Um, these red algaes use calcium carbonate to uh, build structure. These are brittle stars. Um, This is a brittle star in normal CO2. This is a brittle star that's been exposed to elevated CO2. These things are the same age. So this is in a larval stage. So extremely stunted. And the reason is because these, there's these, the, the long arms, which have these little series of hairs on it, cilia, that direct food towards the mouth, which is in the center. Um, those little spicules are made out of calcium carbonate. And in an elevated CO2 situation, that calcium carbonate is, is not available uh, for the creature to fix, to build its skeleton. Clownfish. This is, uh, this is the same species that is Nemo. Um, when exposed to high CO2, uh, situation, their olfactory sense is uh, impaired to the point where they miss the cue to settle. Um, so a baby Nemo can't find his way home, would be one way to look at it. These, this is a uh, mussel. And this, is, uh, this muscle was exposed to 7.6, which is three points down from ambient um, seawater pH, which is what's predicted to occur within the next, by the end of the century. And they, over time, they corrode. Now, this light spot, that's not, there's the same amount of light on the top of the snail in both pictures. Um, but this shell has gotten so thin that light passes through it. Um, and a mussel with a shell that's so thin that you can see through it is not got any protection from predation anymore. Um, this is an oyster. Um, this is a male that's casting its genetic material to the, to the current. <laughs> and this is when met with a female, this is what's produced. In elevated CO2 situations, these larvae never make it to adults. If they manage to make it to settle in elevated CO2 situation, they are 30, their shells are 30% thinner. Um, and then these, uh, in California, this experiment was done in Bodega Bay. This little snail up here is a, is a whelk. It's, um, it's, non, it's not native to California. It's actually from the East Coast. Um, and it's called an oyster drill. And you see that one on the, on the right-hand side that's got that little tiny hole? That's a, that's a hole that was drilled by the snail. And then, and then you see the, the oyster on the left, you can see through it and you see the, the body of the oyster growing. But in the one on the right, it's um, been eaten. So it's no longer, they, they, they sort of stick their mouth in and just suck everything out. But because the shell is 30% thinner, the whelk eats 30% more oysters per day. The one on the left is normal pH, normal CO2 level. The one on the right is elevated CO2. Not all species of starfish suffer, um, but this one from, this is in Kiel, um, and this would be the Baltic. So 
Some Baltic sea starfish suffer greatly from elevated CO2. This is a sea star. This is from in Sweden. And they did this experiment that they exposed the brittle stars to elevated CO2, and it didn't, it, it perturbed, you know, they had like 12, 13% lower calcification rate. And so it was, it was a metabolic hit, but it was not deadly. But then they exposed the brittle stars to two stressors to see what if there was a synergistic effect. So this, as a stress response, um, brittle stars, they just, they, they just pinched their own legs off. It's just, it's too much. And the, the stress was a known, already um, extant uh, antifungal agent that's washing into the fjords um, and elevated CO2. So they just put two things that are, no, that are already in the environment together and they get, so you just think just CO2, the guy's fine. But you just add one more thing that's already present and the whole thing falls apart. This is a cuttlefish. And cuttlefish build this calcium I mean, cuttlefish, you know, the little, the thing that's part of their skeleton, it's, it's a buoyancy control device. Um, and when exposed to elevated CO2, that um, cuttle bone, they, it, unfortunately, kind of overcompensates. The one on the left is normal CO2 conditions. The one on the right is um, an elevated CO2. And it gets denser and heavier, um, just as a sort of way to deal with, but it's internal, so it's not exposed. So it, there's some odd responses, um, maybe counterintuitive in a certain way. Um, but the metabolic cost of a heavier, I mean, it's a buoyancy control device. It's not supposed to be heavy. It's supposed to be just right. Um, so now they have this, this extra weight they're carrying around. And the way that cuttlefish hunt, you really wouldn't want to have an extra, you know, 15% body weight. Um, and you also wouldn't want the metabolic cost of having to build such a thing um, because it would impair your, um, a lot of creatures are, I mean, they have to, in order to make a living, they have to be incredible athletes, you know, to run down and catch and get away from other creatures that they want to eat or, or that want to eat them. So to uh, impair that um, athleticism or you know, physical um, performance uh, is a bad thing. So it makes them heavier. The metabolic cost of, of trying to accelerate is a big deal. That much more when you want to try to slow down. Um, so, so big consequence. These are coccolithophores. This is, a coccolithophore is a little tiny thing that lives at the surface of the ocean and they make a, an incredible amount of oxygen for us. I mean, for the world, but we need it as well. So this is, this is current CO2 level. Um, put it in, uh, grow some coccolithophores in a lab in an elevated CO2 situation. And this is what will happen to the coccolithophores um, if the CO, current CO2 level is doubled. Not current, if the pre-industrial uh, age level is doubled which means we only have to get to a little over 500 parts per million. Right now we're pushing 400. And if you boosted it even a little more, the whole world falls apart if you're a coccolithophore. I sort of looked at this as it's, it's, like it's spilled its guts. This is a pteropod. Um, also called a sea angel, 
what it's a little tiny snail that's um, its foot has evolved into these two little wings. They're also called sea butterflies. Um, and that beautiful little shell, very delicate. These guys live, they live um, at the surface. They're part of the plankton. Um, and there's a, there's a major part of the food chain in, um, in the high latitudes. 60% of the stomach contents of some species of salmon, when they're six inches long, not the entire lifespan of, of, of salmon, but at a certain stage of development, 60% of, of their diet um, are it's this species of pteropods. So this is just the shell of uh, Southern Ocean Limacina. And this is, we sealed this thing in a petri dish with a glass top on it at a pH to, to, to simulate um, what was predicted, this is five, six years ago, what was predicted to be the pH level at the end of uh, this century. This is uh, one day, just 24 hours later. This is uh, a couple days after that. So it's the, the surface, it's starting, it's, not, it's losing its transparency, the surface is starting to be pitted um, because the, the aragonite is starting to dissolve. So this is 45 days. And that's what's left is not shell. That's just a little cuticle. It's like the little soft tissue that lines the shell. And then I disturbed the petri dish and the thing just kind of started to float around inside. It had basically no mass to it. So I, I sent a note uh, a couple days ago to a guy at uh, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration who studies um, ocean acidification, asking uh, for what he thought the, the most immediate new thing that I could share with you all. Um, and I thought it was going to be a nice little overview of the current state of the world, you know, like old news in a certain sense. But he sent me this paper that they just authored. And we did this simulation in a lab in San Marcos, um, California, uh, in the lab of a woman named uh, Vicki Fabry, who sort of was the central character in, in the story that I read in the New Yorker magazine written by Elizabeth Colbert. Um, you know, which is when I learned what ocean acidification was. And Vicki had observed this phenomenon, and we, then we reproduced it in her lab. Um, and then uh, Richard and, and Noah have used this series of pictures various ways to try to communicate about ocean acidification. But then just yesterday, yesterday um, Dr. Feely sent me this newspaper not a newspaper, a, 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 a scientific paper, article that they just published. And I thought that this was going to happen after I'm dead. I thought it was just, I should warn, I, sh I should share this thing that I learned that, you know, that this is bad. You know, to lose a serious part of the food chain, to lose such a beautiful creature. Is, is a disaster. Um, but then I get this paper that says that this is not 50 years from now. This is, they actually found out that this is happening right now already. There are upwellings off the coast of California that are 
40, 50 year old water, so they're already in an industrial uh, era state of CO2, not as bad as we're pumping into the system now, but that water coming up from deep um, has been, enough CO2 has been added to it that it's already um, these beautiful little creatures. So this thing that I thought I was going to be able to escape personally um, I, is happening sooner than, than anybody thought. So this is another pteropod. This guy only eats Limousina. Um, and he's a beautiful little guy. Um, he's the, he's the, the serious predator of this guy, or what was left of this guy. Um, the, using these guys is actually how they actually got the tissue out of the, the pteropods that they wanted to do the experiment with. Um, but they're beautiful. But they, you know, if, that, if the limousina goes, this uh, pteropod is certainly attached in, in, inextricably. I mean, the two things are. So I did this little thing last night of assembling. Of, of all the creatures that I photographed in the last couple of years, how many of them uh, are at risk. So the, in this, if I look at this and I look at calcifiers or the fact that I know that crabs also have, it's a big metabolic hit to them, um, elevated CO2 situation, take away half of these creatures. That's the snails, the cowries, Cephalopods have a terrible hit to their respiration from elevated CO2 situations. They have, you know, they're nothing but exposed flesh. They don't, they, the, the controlling their pH, they have, um, it's a big deal. I mean, there's a, there's a reason why our uh, animals like their pH about 8.0, not 7.7. It's, there's a, there's a significant, I mean, in a, in a normal situation, our, the pH of our body is the same as the ambient sea right now, not 7.7 uh, in an upwelling event or 50 years from now. Brittle stars, sea urchins, cushion stars, brittle stars. This little snail, snail is so, I mean, he has a shell. It's like a little glass. He can see through the shell. He's got his little eyes there. So cool. It's a little Mary Dastria. This guy's, yeah, half, it's about the size of my fingernail. Lots of brittle stars out there in the world. So this is just a little, you know, what, what creatures I've seen in the last little bit that are seriously at risk. Before I started doing this work of these one cubic foot surveys um, and other sort of little biological surveys, um, I spent 17 years photographing things on the US endangered species list, um, which was, I mean, it was, a, it was lovely to be able to travel around and photograph uh, California condors and grizzly bears and Florida panthers and, and hundreds of species of beautiful plants. And it wasn't, I mean, people used to ask me, isn't that depressing? Um, and no, not really, because they're endangered. They're not extinct. Um, and the Endangered Species Act, from what I saw when it was allowed to function or even, even funded in a mediocre manner, was, was fantastically successful. Um, the sea urchin, different one, brighter blue. Um, and there's only 15, there are 1,500 creatures, 1,500 
creatures on the U.S. endangered species list that occur in the United States. Um, and that's a daunting, uh, terrible amount of threatened life. But then I look at, um, I mean, that's an entire nation. But then if you sort of make the calculation of just even a single coral reef and all of its inhabitants, and you think about half of it disappearing, that's about 3,000 different creatures just in one spot. Because on the, on the reef crest in, in Morea, it's, it's calcul they don't even know for sure yet because they think they really only found about 60% of it um, in, in the Morea Biocode project. Um, but they think there's about 6,000 creatures out on the reef crest. And if you, if you just look at the kinds of creatures sensitive to ocean acidification alone, not sea level rise, increased storms, or temperature, but just the ocean acidification aspect, and you remove half of them, um, the, it's devastating. Look at the, the shape of the, the little, it's like a, f basically, it's so when it burrows into the sand, it's a one-way thing, it can go in, but it's hard to come out. So it's like, it's got this shell that, that keeps it, keeps other creatures, makes it harder for them to dig the clam out of the sand. It's, it's like brilliant. This guy's great. And this, this is another like, you know, condo. It's like, it's a limpet, but it's also some algae, and it's like got three species of algae there. This is a echinoderm, a sea urchin. This is a kind of uh, abalone. Starfish. It's a bat star. This is from California. It's an octopus. These guys are great. A little crab and a little snail. So this is a pteropod with the, you know, the, that same species. Um, the shell that we photographed was a specimen from Antarctica. This one's from a plankton net underneath the Golden Gate Bridge off in San Francisco. This is a, a snail, uh, some marine snail veliger. We didn't, don't, no, don't know the species. It's kind of like Dumbo. A little juvenile sea star. Snails. Oh, this guy, this little bump on him, that's probably one of these guys inside of him. They're like really nasty parasites, but, <laughs> but kind of beautiful. You know, it's like, like wow, hmm. <laughs> really creepy. Really creepy. Can you imagine that guy crawling inside of you? Oof. <laughs> this is a lot of snails. This it's not covered with feathers. It's he's got this this snail has this mantle that's got all this frilly stuff on it. So when he's like really comfy, um, he'll like put his mantle out, cover himself with it. It's how he gathers food. Sea urchin, scallop. These little things right there, that thing, one, two, these little things here around the edge, those are eyes. So cool, I mean. Lots of sea stars. Huh. 
These are really cool. I, I think they're, what are they, Gorgonia or something? I can't remember what they're called. These are from the Caribbean. Green with purple tips. I mean, we're making a real mess, but the world is still beautiful. I mean, look at that. So great. Little corals, brittle star. I mean, there's a lot. Ooh, look at that one. It just goes on and on and on and on. I took half of them out already, and there's still a lot. This guy. I mean, how's he put all of that back in that shell? <laughs> Fantastic. Mom, babies. <laughs> the octopus. Another octopus. Squid. So these guys. That's a cowrie. Little bubble snail. Purple and yellow. That's all I have. I made a little list of more things that I could photograph. Um, you know, there's these uh, uh, foraminifera, which are uh, little uh, unicellular algae um, that are very big deal in the carbon sink, um, on a par with the uh, coccolithophores. Um, but in elevated CO2 situations, their, their uh, bodies are 30% smaller. Uh, coral larvae have trouble settling. Cold water coral might be the first to be affected by a CO2. Cold water coral are the things that live at the top of seamounts. Um, and there are probably 100,000 deep seamounts covered in cold water coral worldwide. That's like, um, you know, volcanic islands that actually break the surface. The Northwestern Hawaiian Islands would be an example of that. But there are um, many, many, many more of these things that don't quite break the surface. Um, the Great Barrier uh, coral reef calcification rates have decreased by 14% between 1990 and 2005. Those are, um, it's not an estimate, that's an instrument in place that recorded um, decreased calcification rates. Um, all coral reefs are expected to be in a state of net dissolution when CO2 reaches 560 parts per million. Um, that's just, that's simply a doubling of pre-industrial uh, era. That's just a, a benchmark, which is, uh, we're already at uh, 400, so we're well on our way. So there's just a long list, which I'd be, and I think we're going to prepare this and share it in another format so you all can have this list. And I think it might be interesting to, um, as a way to not get depressed and just sitting on your hands like you can't do anything and the world's going to end, because it's not. Um, for students to, there's a long list of like threads that they could pull on right here that would be really interesting. And to illustrate these things 
in a way that takes it from a very dry, um, inaccessible, for the most part, scientific paper um, into something that the students could make um, a contribution of their own. I mean, I, I didn't think that, um, I always wanted to take pictures that, that the world had a use for. Um, and when I was really young, I used to think that I wanted to take pictures that mattered. Um, but now I'll just settle for useful. Um, and um, I think that figuring out how to communicate um, is, I mean, it, it has its own rewards and, and it beats sitting on your hands, getting depressed. Um, process and utility are everything, I think. Because um, you never know whether you're actually going to succeed, uh, so you might as well do something interesting, have a good time along the, uh, on the road to try to get there. Thank you.